I got your ear. Or maybe, uh, yeah, you know. Do people still do that? Do people have kinks for that? Oh, I wonder. Oh, someone has a nose kink. That's right on the nose. Seatbelts, everyone. Cause like, Hawk, if you love magic school bus, isn't it? Beep, beep. Seatbelts, everyone. 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 Seatbelts, ever
have come a very long way. But this entire search for the history of a safe word, where it came from and who coined the term, actually started with a tweet that I was just kind of being like playful and like, I figured somebody on the internet had a very simple answer. And so I posted this and said, Dear sex nerds and info people, I'm on the lookout for the first use, etymology, or history of the term safe word. Context, kinky or not. And if you have any findings, inklings, or history, please help. I wasn't ready. <laughs> Doing my research, I had leather historians pointing out that we had internet archives with different books like Leatherman Handbooks, at Urban Aborigines, a bunch of really good BDSM books and literature. But looking through those, we couldn't find safe word as one word. We couldn't find it safe space word. Turns out we had to look to the zines and handbooks to find the real meat and potatoes. I was looking into and talking with some of my local SF San Francisco gays. Hi, gay. <laughs> and we kind of got to the thoughts that maybe Drummer Magazine, which was a publication that started in LA in 1975, that talked about queer sex, generally from a male perspective in a very sexy masculine way, but in a way that was meant to transcribe our history as well as talk about the safety and mechanics of kink. And with a little help from my friend Ray Spannon here in San Francisco, we were able to actually look through all 214 possible <laughs> drummer magazines. But in 1989 in Drummer Magazine, the issue 196 had one single usage of the term safe word as a, a, a kink and BDSM term meant to be about safety. And I think they even like poised it as like the bottom should have a safe word, which is all like, that's good, that's good. But I wasn't, I wasn't fully satisfied. satisfied. I was not prepared for the next thing that Ray said, which was, but have you looked into the lesbian sex mafia? Because they might've had it before then. What? Apparently the lesbian sex mafia, or the LSM for short, was the first organization back in the day that put out pamphlets, booklets, and handbooks on the how-tos of BDSM and kink. Lesbian sex mafia! It turns out that a year before Drummer published anything about safe words, in 1988, the Lesbian Sex Mafia had a lesbian s &M safety manual that they kindly were spreading for more than just the lesbians. But I do want to I do want to point out, like the lesbians, when we look through history of BDSM and kink, were so much better about not only documenting but properly writing. I'm not saying the men weren't there and they didn't do the work, but the lesbians were very thorough. <laughs> On top of, they are one of the largest and most influential backbones when it comes to our culture when we talk about kink, because during HIV and AIDS, it was the lesbians who really went out of the way to make sure that the gay men who were slowly just coming down with this disease were taken care of and that our history did not diminish. In fact, as we see here, they were very good about documenting, writing, and making sure information was not only documented, but shared thoroughly through our groups. And while ending on lesbian sex mafia as the etymology for safe words would be like perfect, it didn't end there. Lesbian sex mafia! And hey, today's episode would not be possible without today's safe sponsor, Adamail, who's making sure your toys are not only body safe, but that if you're looking to get a little kinky and BDSM in the bedroom, you're sure to get toys that are safe for your pleasure. Maybe you've got too many bottoms and you're not sure how the play is gonna happen. Or maybe you need to train that sub. Apparently this glows in the dark. Train me, AI daddy. I'm the top. Maybe you need a, like a tool of some kind as well. All available at Adam Mail? Ahoy there. Or maybe you're just trying to like, <laughs> I love the ad the Admiral. <laughs> oh, it's an electronic, it's, it's an electronic cock ring and butt toy. Oh. Okay, wait, but the anal training kit, I love the sizes that they give you which is lovely, they all feel good, but especially the, the largest one, which is actually also remote controlled. So you can put that in and you can tell, hey Alexa, turn my butt plug on. I'm just kidding, she, she can't control it, thank God. Could you imagine if Alexa had control over our butt plugs? <laughs> So please go give some love to Adam Mail, who supports us and has been one of our longest running sponsors here, has great body safe toys, and they also give back to our community by putting some of the proceeds to stop and end HIV and AIDS. So go to adammail.com, use offer code WATTS to get up to 50% off of your toy and free shipping on any orders over $20 in the US. Certain exclusions apply. That would be a terrible safe word, certain exclusions apply. <laughs> but I would stop and consider what are those exclusions exactly? <laughs> 
You guys kept coming through in that thread, and we saw that in the Body Politic, which was a Canadian monthly magazine, and in a specific article called Coming to Terms with Power in the Body Politic in 1982, there was an actual excerpt that not only talked about safe words, but talked about colors and code words when speaking of sexual acts. I quote, My friends are delighted, and we would find a swing board for me to lie down on. I tell them I'm feeling very vulnerable and do not want any sexual play at this time. Only whipping. Only whipping? I gulp. I tell them my safe word, safe word being two words, for stopping is red, and pink for lightening up. And while this isn't the perfect traffic light system, it's a really interesting excerpt because it's not only in Canada, but in 1982, so even further back in time. And the body politic also gets an honorable mention with another article that they wrote talking about safe words and the complexities of, or the misleading and confusing nature of a safe word, especially when it comes to things like stop. And I quote, if you protest every single time he gets sexy with you, whether you really want him to stop or not, how is he supposed to know the difference? That's why the common device of a safe word, as two words, evolved. The code word, a bottom, or a top for that matter, can use to say, hey, I'm not fooling around or flirting. I really need this to stop. Get out of a role. We have to do something different. They actually were talking about the complexities of safe word. And not only that, but some doms nowadays could even learn, tops can use safe words too. This is one of the first instances that we talk about safe words, but we don't just put it on the bottom. And the bottoms were also a, a term coined for the people that were generally receiving the kink as well. We'll get to that in a second. As, as this was fascinating information, thank you Canada. Oh, Canada. Thank you for your, your services and information, but again, not the etymology of the word itself. Because days later, Jesse Shieldlower actually pinged into my email. I got an email. People steal email. You got mail. Now, Jesse had some credentials. Profiled by the New York Times and editor of uh, uh, this little thing called the Oxford Dictionary, Jesse literally wrote the book about the usage of and the history of the F word. I'm, I'm not kidding. Now, I'm not joking, bitch. So when they said that they had some information about safe words, my hole was open for information. Give me the information, Jesse. Please, I need it. I've been searching for so many days. Also, Jesse, can you let me know how to say lexicographer? Lexico, I keep saying, I wanna say cock. I can't. Hunk, if you're horny, mm. I just love sodomy so much. Beep, beep. Seat belts, everyone. Anyway, Jesse wrote me this freaking amazing email, tons of information in it. The TLDR of it all though, came down to the use of safe word. Now, the very first publication that we could find of safe word as two words, safe space word, was actually by the SF group called Sanwa. Can you guess what group and community this was part of? That's right, it was a lesbian feminist based SM group. Let's go lesbians. Let's go lesbians! Let's go lesbians! Turns out we're no longer in the 80s with our history, and in 1979, the SM Collective produced a booklet called what color is your handkerchief? Personally, mine's usually gray, um, but I have a lot of different shades. I have like a dark blue, a navy, or even a royal, uh, a daddy green or lime is fun. Oh, rainbow's always good. How'd that yellow one get in there? You're peeing, make sure that you are actually in the toilet. And this was the first sexuality reader, which actually included a glossary that had the term safe word as two words, but it was defined as a code word partners involved in SM sex agree to use to stop the action immediately. And in a search for the term safe word, we also found out the Samwa group was the first instance that they printed the word bottom to refer to someone in the receiving sense of BDSM. Because Pat Khalifa, the founder and a writer also in The Advocate, actually put out a piece that specifically said, the bottom is usually given a safe word or code action that she can use to stop the scene. The safe word allows the bottom to enjoy a fantasy that the scene is not consensual and to protest verbally and resist physically without halting stimulation. Again, in passing, this was one of the first times that bottom was used in this kind of context. And this was in 1981. So thank you, Samwa, for not only doing the work for documenting all this, but giving us a proper context to safer sex. And bottoms, thank you bottoms. And linguistically, Jesse even made note that safe word versus safe space word versus safe hyphen word doesn't really matter. We're, we're, we're grasping at straws because the meaning is all there and they're referring to the same action and, and verbiage. Especially when we look at compound words like safe word, we usually see those kinds of words as spaced out, then later on hyphenated, and then to give it even more importance, connected later on down the line, as we see with safe word. So essentially, 
A professional linguist and editor of the dictionary said that it should be safe word as a one word. I don't want to see anyone spelling it safe space word ever again, okay? It's what's the safe word, not what's the safe space word. I'm very invested in this, okay? I'm very invested. Just let me have this one, okay? Safe word. It's one word. Please. But it was in that article written by Pat that was in the feminist magazine Heresies where they used that code action to mean safe word and where not only my mind got going, but Pat and other historians also chimed in to say, well, it wasn't always called a safe word, but the concept of it has been around since even longer. Turns out safe words were a derivative term of something called keywords, or I guess code words. But the keywords were taught by Robin Roberts at the Society of Janus. Again, another organization out of San Francisco. And it should be noted that this was a pansexual organization, but this organization existed even before I think pansexual was a, a popularized term that we used. So this group was not only ahead of its time, but was this wonderful conglomeration of all sorts of queer people, some het people, men, women, uh, people in between that came together to not only discuss kink, but to make rules and publish and write things about kink, even if it was kind of secretive. And this is really going back because the Society of Janus was the second founded BDSM group in the United States with major inductees who literally wrote the books around and about sex from Guy Baldwin to Gail Rubin to Dossie Easton and Janet Hardy. And if those last two names especially stand out to you, it's because they wrote The Ethical Slut. The first two names really stand out to me, but that's because I know a bit about my history and the leather culture. And, and, and Gail's a lovely human. And it should be noted that within the Society of Janus, many people will say that Robbins didn't really get all the credit that he was due for really leading the way and whether it was about the code words or the safe words or the, the key words, started what we would call the foundation for safety within the King community. And seriously, I just wish that there was a lesbian sex mafia, society of Janus, like rock groups, that it's just, it's the, it's the perfect name for a band name. Lesbian sex mafia! Also, the, is Society of Janus, is, is that a Mean Girls reference? Oh my God, it's your dream come true, diving into a big pile of girls. I'm kidding, Mean Girls did not come before the Society of Janus. But Janus was a lesbian, right, in Mean Girls? So we have the etymology and the printings of safe words. We have the classes and the colloquialism that is spoken word safety with keywords and cowords. But even as I looked through my history of the BDSM community and looking through safe words, there was one thing and this is more of a my own personal hunch that was the concept of a safe word. And it transcends English language writing and even just speaking because it happens to go all the way back to shibari or the art form known as kimbaku. Now looking through books and even references to safe words and we look into kimbaku and the ancient form of rope bondage, and we do see a type of safe word that was used within that culture. And Kimbaku can be traced all the way back to the 1600s. So that does predate the 1970s or so by just a few years. The needs of all those involved in the play. And some of those phrases and words included muzukashi, meaning difficult to indicate the particular position to tie in what's causing discomfort or pain. Yamaru or stop to indicate that the activity should be stopped immediately or owarimasu meaning finished to indicate the activity was complete. Along with those words came tapping gestures, meaning you needed to reposition or maybe stop, grunting or moans to indicate goods and bads, as well as pre-agreed upon gestures to indicate if you need specific things within the scene. And that sounds like a safe word if I've ever heard one, or at least foundation for the use of and the word that we now use safe word. Whew! History! Seatbelts, everyone! That's just the history. That's just the, 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 the etymology of it. That doesn't even begin to scratch upon the legality of it that came about when I was looking into the safe word. Because it turns out the use of and the concept of a safe word might actually lead to the decriminalization of certain things within BDSM and law stuff. <laughs> Where were you March 2nd when I was filming this and somebody got uh, hurt in a kink scene? Now, when we talk about legalities in BDSM, while not super sexy, it is kind of important considering many, many cases of BDSM are seen as essay or the not peppery, but salty variety, things I can't say on YouTube because I don't want to be flagged inappropriately. And even in that, we always get questions about like, 
contracts or legal shit like that. And we do have a video asking a, a lawyer anything that you can watch if you wanna get into the nitty gritty of that. But it turns out safe words might soon be something that helps you legally to not only make sure that you are consensually having BDSM play, but that you can't be charged or accused of being inappropriate or harming someone within reason legally. Objection, overruled. I played Phoenix Wright, so I'm an expert on law. That's not how, no, don't, don't listen to someone who said that's not how law works. Because it turns out NCSF or the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom is trying to change section 10 of the penal code that has to deal with SA and how it's treated. And the crux of that decriminalization of BDSM is safe words. Now the NCSF is trying to start what's called EPP when you're looking at BDSM related cases. And EPP stands for explicit prior permission. Now, you need to have permission, aka consent, to do consensual scenes, obviously. But even when we talk about CNC or more edge play -y stuff, which some of which can be covered within this penal code change to, to decriminalize and hopefully make BDSM less stigmatized in our community, but it has to revolve around having a safe word that is literally being written into one of the clauses of this change. Meaning that you'll be allowed to do BDSM and give someone permission to do something of physical force, restraint in a CNC kinky sort of way, and says that legally you can BDSM someone so long as you're only hurting them and not harming them with consent. I love BDSM some. <laughs> I'm gonna BDSM you so hard. Meaning under EPP, you are making sure that you have a safe word, whether it's in text, whether it's in verbal communication, whether it's even in a contract. You can actually use contracts now legally, maybe if this passes. And having one less barrier when it comes to BDSM related cases, which I hope and personally think will lead to less stigma on the whole. I heard myself say that and I still said it, so. Any hole is a goal. Which doesn't cover all edge play, but if you're at all curious, check out the consent counts by NCSF or EPP, explicit prior permission, on their website. There's a lot more info there. We even had a few of the representatives on a podcast recently asking pretty much more to these questions as well. We've done lots of legal related things and kink. Please check that out. And to that point, please make sure that you're doing kink and sex and fun stuff and that you're making it sexy. Make, make kink sexy, especially in negotiation. Make it fun to make consent happen, which is a really exciting thing. Legally, we are using BDSM to hopefully make BDSM not only destigmatized, but more accessible, easier to talk about, and I hope leads to less ways in which we criminalize people or stop people from living their best lives in their sexy ways, but still let them have families, still let them have their jobs, still let them just be a normal human in our society, because BDSM is something that is still, but especially in the past, was something that was used against people and a lot of their family, friends, and even workplace environments. And while we've come a long way, I hope that we continue to use our knowledge and our breadth and our just documentation to show that kink and BDSM is not a bad thing and actually helps us, especially our more vanilla friends, to understand ourselves sexually. Because safe words, kink, no matter where you lie on the kinky to vanilla realm, safe words can be a good thing. Kink can be transformative and learning. And logistically, I do have a few thoughts on safe words that I want to save for the end, intentionally. So let's let's get into the final thoughts. Hello, I'm the final thought. What do I think about safe words? Three, two, one, go! Now, if you are still watching this video, hey, how are ya? Thanks for watching. Did you have any questions? Leave them in the comments. But I want to talk to you face-to-face, -face, real talk, about safe words. Now, I've kind of already mentioned that I do use safe words. My personal safe words, usually Godzilla, or, or red, but I've never had to use them. I think safe words are a freaking fantastic tool. They are necessary. I always make sure that we have them when we play and I, I hope you do too, but I think that they're not perfect if I'm being completely honest. Sometimes we make them too difficult or hard and we don't make them jarring enough when we choose a safe word. We joke a lot about them, but we also feel this almost need to perform in BDSM that I think a lot of people need to really you know, knock out of that head. But to that, some people just physically can't use a safe word in a scene. And I wanna talk realistically about the logistics of using a safe word as well. Obviously a safe word shouldn't take too much energy or brain power to remember, so don't make it like onomatopoeia 
or supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Like if you had something in your mouth. If you had something in your mouth, it's very hard to say things. That's why it's really good to have non-verbal safe words. And or just a word that's very jarring and you can say with a gag in your mouth. Valenciaga! Valenciaga! Like, choose a word that has enough syllables in it that even when your mouth is dry, you kind of get it out, you know? And it's got to be something you can say. So let's say you're like me who does get a little bit non-verbal when I get into a really deep subspace. It's really hard sometimes to even approach saying that safe word maybe. And while I've never felt like I couldn't say a safe word, I've absolutely had scenes where as a top, I'm checking in. I'm the one being proactive to make sure that the, the bottom not only knows that they can say a safe word if they need it, but I'm being like, hey, how are you? Where are we at? In that, I wanna make sure that we are, we are really compassionate about our safe words and how we use them. Because whether we're the bottom that might have a bit of a hard time in a deep subspace, or the top who's doing their best to have a fun, sexy scene, you guys are working together. This is a tool to not only protect someone else, but hopefully you are taking into yourself to protect yourself first and foremost. At the very bare minimum, that is for your safety and your safety first. And realistically, safe words are not always safe for that reason because sometimes we can get in our own head or in the really unfortunate sense, we could play with someone who doesn't respect those. And so I say that not to scare you, but to just be realistic that you need to know who you're playing with. You need to negotiate well and you need to feel that you can trust the person you're playing with because that's your safety, realistically. And I wanna make sure that you feel comfortable even saying a safe word with that person before you get into play with them. If that means like practicing the use of a safe word, by all means. The best way to make sure a play goes off without a hitch is practicing it. So the best way to make sure your play goes without a hitch, although a hitch in bondage is, is kind of necessary for some shibari and kimbaku. Full circle. And a part of the logistics, what happens when you use a safe word? I see all the talk and the writing about choosing one, making sure it's easy to use, making sure you're comfy, but what happens when you use it? The way that a safe word is used and how we respond should be just like a time out. You stop, you reevaluate, and you treat it seriously. And my good friend Sunny Megatron over at Zipper Magazine actually has a really good analogy that I like to use. And they say, sometimes someone just needs to stop to tie their shoes before resuming play. In that way, you should think about it like a timeout in sports because in sports, sometimes we call timeout or a safe word in order to just let someone retie a shoe, maybe readjust a knot. Other times you have to physically time out, call a person out, give them a red card, full stop, game over, while other times we just need to stop the game, adjust the rules or maybe who's on the field and then keep going. It doesn't mean that play has to stop indefinitely, but it does mean that it needs to pause and stop so we can reevaluate what's going on. Just because a safe word is called doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong, but just that the scene might have gone wrong. And I think that some people can take it too personally when a safe word is called. Let's say I'm topping and someone calls a safe word. I shouldn't take that personally or make it about me. I'm not the one in the situation that needed to stop, that was triggered maybe, or that, that just had some sort of panic reaction. I'm the one in the situation that should be acting, helping, and making sure I comfort the person who called that safe word. Again, not taking it personally, but making sure that I ask how I can help that person to get back into a more comfortable position, or if we need to stop, get them out of it and start that aftercare. And how should you respond if someone uses a safe word? Objection. Nope, wrong. No, that's that's the Phoenix Wright game speaking again, sorry. But this is also kind of the final thoughts category where I talk about the honorable mentions of safe words that people brought up in my thread on entomology for safe words, because safe words are not just something that you use in the bedroom when you're getting sexy, it turns out. There were a number of articles I not only found, but were shared with me about people talking about using safe words in the workplace. And the concept of a safe word being, hey, I'm getting overwhelmed or I'm getting about to be triggered or I need to just stop and reevaluate. It's not a bad concept for some of the workplace environments I've been in. And I even use a safe word when I go to a party, whether it's sexy or not, maybe a club. I have a safe word that myself, daddy, and maybe the people we came with know that if I say that, that we need to go or I need to go at the very least. 
Sports and tapping out were brought up, and I absolutely understand where that could come from. Again, the Kimbaku mention and reference does revolve around and talks about tapping out. But maybe one of my favorite references to the use of safe words was from LARPers. Live action role players, you know, lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt. And within these LARPing live journal posts that I found, they were talking about the use of safe words in a role playing scene to not only help to kind of, you know, throw a line at someone to instigate or incite pretty much a safe word if they needed help out of a situation, but literally, I kid you not, they even talk about dungeon situations. So let's say you're interrogating someone in a dungeon and on a LARPing scene, it gets real serious. You might be like, you might like call it, it's like a callback, you know, you'd be like, and how does that make you feel, pig? Or like, you, there's a line, there's like a callback that you are able to ref respond to. The fact that LARPers have callbacks in safe word form, that's, that's great. The concept of a callback can be used in King 2. If you're a top, you make that like fun, sexy, like, and how does that make you feel, kid? Like, you give the bottom or the person receptive to the, the role play, the person receiving the role play, an opportunity and uh, an out if they need it to make sure the scene goes well and that everybody's still vibing. What a great concept of a safe word, a callback. Like there's so many ways you can make a callback sexy that allows the bottom to feel comfortable enough to be like, you know what, actually yellow, I need a second, please give me a moment. Okay, green, use that to your advantage. At this point, I feel like I've said safe words, I've had at least like four cups of water. If you're playing the game at home, how hydrated are you? Because I'm wet. I might have spilled a little bit on myself as well. That was a lot of history. I never want to talk about safe words ever again. <laughs> Honestly, all things considered, my deep dive into what a safe word is, where it came from, and just the concept of it becoming something within the BDSM community that will further, I hope, help decriminalize BDSM in a larger picture is a lot. Did I enjoy the ride? Absolutely. Did I need to write almost 20 pages of notes? No. But did you enjoy it? Hopefully yes. I find the history of the kink community, while lackluster in many cases, only because we weren't allowed to really document our history, especially telling when people come out of the woodwork and start telling their stories, start sharing their histories, start talking about organizations that really led the way, wrote the physical books on how our community works and how we took care of each other. So I just wanna give a huge old thank you to not only y'all for watching, um, but our community for really stepping up and giving me not only the information of all of our backgrounds and our histories, but really going, oh, I, I actually know the first printing of it, or it was actually mentioned in uh, classes that we just don't have any physical evidence on, but we do have the groups and the people who ran those classes. It's so heartwarming because it shows the real power of the kink community when we put our minds to it, whether our clothes are on or off. And whether you're honking for sodomy or not, just always look out for each other and have a safe word. If you don't have a safe word after this entire episode, eh, were you what? Were, were, were you even watching the video? Because today's safe word is lesbian sex mafia. Uh, my new potential band name, and just a, that's such a good name for a BDSM SM group. That's such a good name. Whether you learned something or not, let me know down in the comments below. And if you have more evidence on the, the history of safe words, let's talk more. If you liked this episode or not, please let me know. And let me know if you enjoy these kind of deep dives into the history, but also the breakdowns of the community itself. I had too much fun doing this. And if you want to join me on the next episode, make sure you subscribe. And I will talk to you guys next time. Bye! I realize this isn't the point of the episode, but uh, I did ask for people's safe words as part of like researching this. Some of my favorite answers include lawsuit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like everyone uses pineapple as a safe word, but there's gotta be more interesting safe words than that.